I often reflect upon in being here of the successes that I've had and where I started out from. And I, and I, I attribute a lot of my resilience and my aspirations and my ambitions in having a strong mom in particular, who from a really early age always tried to articulate in different ways, like verbally and just through doing that there's no limits. You know, there's an either you're not confined by your circumstance. Hi, my name is Orlando and you're listening to Cooking Back to Our Roots with my mom, Vivian Aqua, the DEI consultant at Amplify DEI. My mom will be talking to different guest speakers from the African diaspora in the Netherlands. The podcast is not just about food, but also about connecting the conversation with our roots and cultivating a deeper appreciation for our shared heritage. Welcome to the Cooking Back to Our Roots podcast, Christina. And I'm curious about who you are, what you do. Can you share that with the audience, please? Oh, a loaded question. <laughs> I guess the... <laughs> The highlights of who I am, I'm uh, an American born in New York from the East Village. I'm a, a mom of two elementary school kids. I'm a wife and professionally, I'm an entrepreneur, an investor. And I also sort of think of myself as an advocate uh, for others who have shared experience with me, whether it's on the, the entrepreneurial side, the investor side, or just you know, being an, an expat mom, American living in the Netherlands. <laughs> Okay, I'm have to share something about Christina because I've known Christina. Yes, she's an angel investor, also a powerhouse who had her own company. She still has her own founding company. And Christina is, the way that I met her is a next level boss entrepreneur, which a lot of people can learn more about. So Christina, you can share your extended bio. This is the spelling room. You can share your extended bio. Come on. And that's true. That's true. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you know, my, I think in terms of like professionally speaking, I started, I've lived a couple of different professional lives. So my first career was working in, in banking. I worked at, at Goldman Sachs in New York and in London for eight years uh, from the high highs through the the, the Great Recession through 2012. And around that point, there was this sort of evolution happening with how technology was transforming our lives. And I got so inspired by this, the smartphone had been in the market a couple of years. And I was just so excited by everything that was happening during that internet 2.0 phase around 2012 that I left banking and I totally shifted to uh, the technology space and made that shift in an very entrepreneurial way. So I moved from 30,000 plus company as an, an executive director into a founder role. And I basically set up a, a consulting practice helping US-based web and app development companies to expand into Europe. I loved that sort of zero to one phase. I did it for about two years. And then I thought it's been fun sort of focusing on a number of different companies, helping them to you know, set up and establish their operations and have those first seats of growth. I want to continue that and I want to go beyond. So I ended up moving to a venture back startup in the B2C space, was the COO of that for two years. And then I left to co-found a video marketing technology startup and was the CEO of that for five years. We sold in 2021. And with that sale also happening around the Black Lives Matter movement, it just, for me, was a wonderful opportunity to think about what is my, what's the legacy I'm going to leave? What's the footprint that I'm going to have world? And how can I be you know, a, a mechanism to help bring solutions to those societal issues that I see today, both socially and environmentally. So that's what I've been doing for the last two years. And I think we met around that, that time when I was, uh, after I had sold my company and I was a bit of a free agent, just moving where inspiration took me. And I found you also very inspiring and it's been wonderful to, you know, collaborate in different ways, just informally in the, in, in bringing more shining more of a light on the wonderful entrepreneurship that happens in the, the Dutch ecosystem and trying yeah. to bring more inclusivity into, uh, into our world. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And the first time that I met you, you were talking and I was just like, 
I'm sitting next to a powerhouse because that's how I see you. You're really a powerhouse who, who knows a way. And it's like a, the fairy godmother of startups, for especially for those who are non-Dutch, those who have a different background. I feel like you are creating a space where people are able to share their challenges, but also to, to see opportunities. And whilst I'm thinking about that, I'm also thinking happening in my mind what happened in the US, but I'm, I'm letting that go. Maybe we can have a conversation about that later on about the anti-affirmative action that is happening at the moment. Oh, yeah. And found there. So that's something that I'm, I'm going to bring up later. But first, right. where are your roots from, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it, it depends on how far back you want to go. I think something funny, you know, having grown up in the East Village, the East Village, I mean, it's sort of, in terms of look and feel, it's a bit like the pipe here in the Netherlands, but it's basically, you know, there's there's just, there's so much diversity in the East Village and that in terms of background, in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of religion, but growing up in the East Village, I have a very, uh, I have a lot of different types of uh, ancestry in my background. So <laughs> I, I was asked if I was Hawaiian, Filipino, Puerto Rican, Latin, Asian. Um, but, you know, so I have a little bit of um, Chinese in my background. I have Polish in my background. Well, I've got, yeah, it's uh, my family, especially on my father's side, has really been very adventurous in terms of moving between different countries. Um, but my father's from the Netherlands, from uh, Suriname, so he's got Dutch roots. Um, mm-hmm. And my mother is Puerto Rican from the Caribbean. But um, I feel like I'm a New Yorker, I'm a Puerto Rican, I have Surinamese. And so, depending on who I'm with, I feel mm-hmm. maybe I lean into one of those different parts of my background. So, yeah, I feel as though I'm a sort of global citizen with, with, with a couple of areas heavily represented. It feels like, because when, when I was having the conversation with Sergio, I was talking about his kids and I see some similarity with, with what you have with his kids, that his kids are global citizens and you are a global citizen, especially when you're talking about your roots, but also where you have lived, right? You worked in London, you were born and raised in New York, and now you landed in the Netherlands, which I have a lot of question marks for, right? <laughs> you might want to see what? Uh, me too. I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the easy answer. I, I love that. I'm, I'm, even though my on my father's side, there the, the Netherlands is heavily represented most recently mm-hmm. through the Surinamese uh, footprint, but I met my now husband at a bar in New York. He was living in London at the time, I in New York, and then we sort of slowly made our way to the same country, which was uh, England, lived there in London a couple of years. And then as many Dutch folks do, they they lure their partners back. It's good that the other thing. And um, I have to say, I was not, I wasn't so, I didn't understand all the perks of living in Amsterdam until I moved here. And now I... I love it. It's a wonderful place to be, especially if you have kids. There's such a nice, you know, great balance of, of greenery and village like city atmosphere, but also a lot of international, a lot of international folks here. So it feels like it's when the weather's nice, it feels like the perfect place to live. <laughs> it's a good thing that you're saying when the weather is nice. It's, it's sunny today. So I'm in that mindset, but yeah, it's, it's been a rainy October and November. True, true, definitely. So, what is your favorite meal that you want to share with us? Yeah, I, it's going to come from my Puerto Rican side. That's uh, going. And I think so. It's called pasteles, mm. and they're made from yuca root. And the I think one of the reasons that the pasteles come to mind right now is it's also a dish that's mostly eaten around the holidays because it's so labor intensive to make. So it's 
it's almost like a tamale. If you, that's a little bit more well known, yeah. at least in the states. But it's like a little package that's stuffed with meat in most cases, pork. Not as Puerto Ricans, we love pork. But um, but yeah, it's it's delicious. I don't. I, I'm not sure if it if I find it delicious because it really is delicious <laughs> and has all you know this this really complex flavor, or if it's just something around comfort food because I remember watching my grandmother like, spending the day with her. Basically, it's like a, a six to eight hour affair, and you all yeah. are in the kitchen and you know every every step of it. As a kid, you take part in little parts of the process, and otherwise, you're just sort of standing around and watching your mom and grandma and aunts just you know sit and mash and stuff and wrap and boil the <laughs> stuff so, yeah it's a whole process of that oh yeah it's a whole process and then you know it tastes that much better when you're done with it and it's only like once a year that typically it's made so and it's around christmas time so, so i think that's why customers are top of mind and i'm gonna get some when i go to new york for christmas so it's uh, i'm really looking forward to that <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and when it comes to your Vietnamese side, do you have a favorite dish on that part? Ooh, uh, I love a little lot. You know, and I listened to one of the other episodes with some people with Vietnamese uh, ancestry, and Pom was mentioned. P O M. And I have to say, I don't know what it's made of, but it tastes really good. So. I think bomb would be one. Uh, rice and beans was also mentioned, and that's the other staple food that is for me a real comfort food that I always crave when I see my mom and I go home for the holidays. So that's also nice that it's a uh, you know there are some things that are a little bit you know cross cultural, and rice and beans is one of those dishes. So I can get it on both sides. It's great. <laughs> 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 and that's awesome. That's awesome. Pom pom is a very laborsome dish. That too, is it? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a laborsome dish to make, and I would rather go to my Surinamese friends to to get the real deal instead of making it myself because it's mm-hmm. a laborsome dish that you have to make, and I don't have time for that. <laughs> I know, I know. Me neither. So I'm lucky that there's a really yummy small tiny store that does uh, all these dishes, all the best dishes. Bara is another one that I really like. Or sort of me, sort of side dish. I'm not sure if it's baked or fried, but it's t- fried. Very good. Is it? Uh, no. Yeah, be yeah. Big. Sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, uh, it is a, it is. It feels like a treat, regardless. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm also lucky that I have a place that I really like, just two doors down, and it's always great to support you know, mom and pop restaurants as well. Yeah. Awesome. You mentioned a little bit about the episode that you watched with Hillary and Sergio that was the Suriname episode, but what did you learn from from watching that episode? I think that the it, it was something that Hillary mentioned where, you know, there's just something about comfort food or there's just some mm-hmm. about the food that, that you grew up with, with your family and that serves as a comfort. And she made this, she mentioned that through her work, she's taken to a lot of, you know, these wonderful expensive restaurants and, I mean, she could go away for a week or something and have every night eating out. But then when she gets home, really what she's craving and really what she's missing is Mm -hmm. this is the, are these dishes that he and um, that she grows up grew up with or that he associates as comfort food so i that i think this concept of comfort food and sometimes it's not you know might not necessarily be the most sophisticated food or something that that people outside of your culture can appreciate but mm-hmm. it doesn't it, it, it for me it's just the i guess the memories that i associate it with that's probably what I enjoy the most about eating that food or drinking that drink. And I don't really think about it. I just think about, mm, this is so delicious. I want more. Like mm-hmm. I have, I have a coffee that I absolutely love and it's called, brand is called Cafe Bustelo. Mm-hmm. And it's a Dominican, it's made in the Dominican Republic. And 
it's something that you'll you get in the grocery store or in a you know little like a small um yeah they call them um they, yes i don't know if they have them here but ba- basically it's just a really small grocery store overnight store it's just real cheap cheap coffee mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I love it. I have to have it every morning. So whenever I go to New York, I stuff my bag with like ten. It comes in brick. Yeah, <laughs> packing patch <packed> bricks. <laughs> and my husband is a real coffee connoisseur. And I made this delicious cup of coffee. Can I make you some? You have some. And he's really like, no, that can be the heck yeah, yeah. He, he, he smells it and he thinks that and he just doesn't you know doesn't appreciate it let's say it like that and he thinks it's bitter and I'm like, what are you talking about this is delicious and i think it's also because i grew up smelling it and that's what my mom used to drink when i was growing up so with this sort of thing you know that that maybe at the surface i don't under I, I don't it's not really the main thing that comes to mind with why i like it but probably the biggest reason why i like it is the memories associated with comfort comforting environment that it just sort of brings me back to subconsciously so i think that's what you know that that was my learning or realization in that episode that this is just such a universal human trait that there are certain smells certain tastes you know that just trigger memories and that's universal that's something that we call yeah. direct about and it's typically around food i had that you know, when i was tasting surinamese peanut soup for the first time and for me, it not as the tom tom, so the plantain balls that they have in it, which which is almost similar to fufu, the Ghanaian version, uh-huh. and, and that's another and thing, thing in the pumpkin. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So when I tasted it, I, it felt like somebody stole the recipe from my grandmother because I can yeah. feel her. She's not here anymore. She she died in two thousand. I could really taste the way she would make that peanut stew or soup and I could really also walk through all those memories that I have from her and it's similar to what you are sharing with your coffee it's not about the taste per se it's about the memories that are associated with the food or yeah yeah what it's else? a it's special mm-hmm. what else captured your attention from the conversation that I had in the episode of Suriname? I don't know. I think it's also the, the you know, the Sur- Suriname also is such an amalgamation of different cultures. Yeah. And I, yeah, you know, what's a bit of a funny fact about my background is my father, as I said, is from Suriname, but I only found out that he was from Suriname when I was around university age. Because he had always told people he was from Brazil because in the state, nobody has ever heard of Suriname. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he got, yeah, yeah. So he got, so, I mean, here it's different in, in the Netherlands. And I think at, even in Europe, it's a bit better known. But in the States, I mean, it still is a not, not very populous country given its size. And not it, there are not huge communities at least in New York, of Surinamese people. So he used to just say for ease and, you know, getting tired and annoyed by people being like, huh, where, where what's Surinam, where is that? Um, and then he always talked about Brazil. And so when I don't even remember, to be honest, how I found out that he, in fact, was from Suriname, but rather, rather than Brazil. But once I found that out, I, for my senior, one of my senior projects towards graduation time, I decided to research Zurd and to understand the history and the culture. And, you know, I know we weren't, we weren't planning to talk much about the Dutch connection to slavery, but what I, you know, the, the first thing that stands out when you look at Suriname is all of the different ancestries that are represented in the community. And, you know, the reason being because in the Dutch slave trade, they were equal opportunity <laughs> pillagers <laughs> and went to a lot of different countries and continents and brought them over to Suriname. Um, but, you know, the, the way I say all of that is is that also come, came out in the interview that you had w- with um, Hillary and Sergei, or Sergio, sorry, 
that that there are also the different a lot of different ways that people identify. I think Sergio was at Hindustani partially, yep. and also Caribbean, and yeah, and of them Caribbean as well, Curacao. So there were a lot of mixtures yeah. in his cult as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I think you know one the, the fact that 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 Suriname is such an amalgamation of cultures is interesting in itself. And beyond that, the way I think that the mindset that people have growing up in this sort of this of a culture where you have you you look differently, maybe you eat differently. I experienced that living in New York City. And I think that's why I also feel like New York City is a part of my breed. Mm. Even even though it's just a location in the US. Yeah. Yeah. New York is a melting pot. That's what I the sense that I get out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It, I mean, you know, I haven't, like to say, I haven't lived there since 2010. I mm-hmm. visit multiple times a year, but the, you know, the extremism that we see in the world today, it just feels like people are further and further apart. So, you know, there, I, I wonder how, I think New York is a, still a bit of an outlier in terms of you know, the ability for different types of people to live alongside and with each other versus other mm-hmm. parts of the state. But I do think that you know, I maybe was in, in that sweet spot during the Obama years in particular, where yeah, there was just a lot. And, and, and post 9-11, I was obviously in New York during the Twin Towers attack. And in that period, there was a lot more. Every, everybody wanted to get along and everybody was being empathic towards each other. And to see from afar, at least in the headlines, how the states, the sentiment in the states, it's really sad. I find it extremely sad, especially, you know, growing up the way that I did in New York, where it really was a melting pot. It feels now that there's just a lot of ingredients together in this pot that are not yes necessarily melting. Yeah. I get you. I understand that. I feel what you were saying a little bit about the Netherlands, especially after mm-hmm. recently. I just thought, yeah, as I said it, I was like, oh, this we're living it here too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. But still, I want to bring back, I want to bring people back to your outlook on your past. What is it that you would like to share to empower people from how you were brought up in New York or how you spend your youth in New York? I I often reflect upon in being hear of the successes that I've had and where I started out from. And I, and I, I attribute a lot of my resilience and my aspirations and my ambitions to having a strong mom in particular, who from a really early age always tried to you know, articulate in different ways, like verbally and just through doing that there's no limits, you know, there's an either you're not confined by your circumstance, you know, growing up in the, the East Village, when I was there, there was not the same amount of, you know, abundance and money that there is now, but all sort of come in afterwards. So, you know, where we grew, where I grew up, the schooling was pretty terrible. And my mother, knowing the importance of an education, she found ways to get me access to maybe the best education that New York could offer private school education through well at that point it was all testing basically you know doing mm-hmm. the test to sort of show the potential my potential and getting scholarship and grants to do you know, studies from five years old so yeah. That's something that I took with me uh, through my, throughout my education. I found ways to fund very expensive educations through these these yeah fund, fund uh, maybe and maybe maybe that's coming a bit full circle. You know, basically these these initiatives I from here. Um, speak it. I'm saying it. Why you were with it? But you already started at the age of five with this topic, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that's also part of it when you when you're on the receiving end at some point mm-hmm. throughout your life, you realize, OK, I've been a beneficiary of a lot of wonderful initiatives and people 
you know, are really putting a lot of effort and money to create, facilitate opportunities for, you know, those who were those who didn't have the same level of opportunities socioeconomically. And for me, that was about to- totally, totally around my education. But now I realize, okay, well, maybe the way that I can contribute back is through my expertise, through my capital and investing in founders of color, gender diverse founders, and also advocating and using a bit of my voice to to raise awareness around the topic. And I think a couple of years ago, it was harder than it than it is now to get people to listen. So now I, I'm actually, I don't know how you feel about this, Vivian, or if you see, I mean, there still is a, a specific archetype that gets the most, you know, press and visibility. <laughs> if, if the viewers could see your face right now. The listeners. My smile of put it all. No, I, I get, I yeah. Have, yeah. get what you're, where you are heading and. Yeah, yeah. Because as it is all, and sadly, a hierarchy yeah. uh, in terms of yeah. visibility. But but there, you know, the needle is shifting. I think the more that we try to bring out this conversation around neurodiversity, around visible uh, disabilities, around mm-hmm. diversity, socioeconomic, uh, ethnic, and the fact that there there are that people are ignoring a lot of signs that there are inequities. The more we talk about it, the the more, you know, the more people realize that it's a problem and the more normalized it becomes that this is something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And it brings me full circle with what we started right now, because I think it was fearless funding that was yeah. dealing with, let's say, with the, there is a scheme in 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 the U.S. that is against against positive what is it i need to look up the affirmative action or yes. that is yeah. against pr- affirmative action they call themselves mm-hmm. the anti affirmative action and you all saw i hope that you read or saw something about what happened to harvard or to colleges or to universities where affirmative mm-hmm. action ended mm-hmm. yeah. and now they want to go further and target companies that are funding minority people i'm yeah. not fun- do that is fearless funding where they are yeah. enabling and supporting black women entrepreneurs yeah. often often let's say most of the time don't even receive one dollar to level up and we need yes, that I, we mean you know to to look at the numbers the, the, what, what, I, what we were sort of thinly veiling before in terms of who gets the most disability around the right. diversity issue you know, gender is the only lens of diversity that's really sort of mainstream at the moment in the startup ecosystem. And of course, that's just, that's not taking into account, into account intersectionality, like, like you talk about, where there's yeah. a female founder of color, for instance. If you look at the female founders get, I think it's 2% of funding in, in Europe is sort of the normal amount that's quoted. And it maybe goes between 1% higher or lower. Yeah. The, uh, Founder, female founders of color get point zero zero one percent. There, where so and then this tiny, this tiny, this lawsuit that you're meant that you're bringing up against Fearless Fund. Fearless Fund had a twenty thousand dollar grant. That is, um, so they have like two different parts. They have the funds that they you know they've raised LP capital and they do investments in startups and that's part of what they do. And then they have a foundation that does grants and those grants are focused on fa- female founders of color. One in this case is $20,000 which is really nothing if we think about it and what, you know how much you need to I mean it's something in the early stages but in the grand scheme of venture capital $20,000 is a blip or not even a blip. And there this this group that you're mentioning, I there's there's a there was this overturning of affirmative action in the state, and there was a group behind that. That group created basically they're creating a bunch of shell organizations mm-hmm. that are whose sole purpose is to create legal actions against different diversity initiatives. Those. Yeah. 
different diversity initiatives. Some are against education, which is the affirmative action, which they they won, unfortunately. Another one is in this case around venture funding. So they basically created this sort of shell company to represent an individual who says, I was aggrieved because I didn't qualify for this. And they took away my ability to get this grant as it's so closed in terms of who it offers. So they are behind that one. They're also attacking corporate initiatives. So corporate board and corporate run bank accelerator programs that are diversity focused. And it's very under the radar. So I'm so glad that you bring it up because it's not very much talked about in Europe. Yeah. But the precedent that they are setting and building by stealthily acting behind, there's a group that's stealthily acting behind all these different shell organizations, shell companies that they set up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, To create these lawsuits. Um, And most people think of them as isolated events. But no, they're not isolated events. It's a very strategic. It's a very big, a major strategy that they're most strategic thing to target. First of all, you're targeting companies that are enabling or supporting Black women, because I think that they know that when they, when they do that, they not only hurt the Black woman, but they hurt multiple families and multiple people behind it. Because even though I am Amplify DEI. With the things that I do, it's not only about me. It's about, you know, setting up, helping other people within the society also to build up. So you're yeah. not only targeting this one person, you're targeting on a whole community behind this one person. And on the other hand, I do have, I'm not going to go into a rant when it comes to Europe, but within Europe, I'm disappointed with the opportunities that I, as a black woman, as a female entrepreneur, have. I you know, I've written a few funding things. I've signed a few proposals, but then again, to receive a negative proposal or to receive you not being honored or you not being seen, you not being awarded, I decided to create my own doors and to create my own space. And it might take me longer to reach to that certain potential because you, you mentioned that $20,000, it's a little, but then again, for the entrepreneur, for the small businesses, it's a lot to be able to level up. It's a lot. That's right. You're right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, the, 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 this is what you notice if you do any sort of research that there are certain groups, you know, black, black women, brown women in, in particular have the same level of ambitions, the same hopes, the same dreams, the same, you know, the, the, they want, they see the same opportunities, and and that we want to want to grasp them. We're just very resourceful, I and mean, like, yeah, we're forced to be. But I, yeah, you know, I, I, I think um, that's something that I have always tried to tried to do is use my uniqueness as an act as, as a, an advantage rather than see it as an factor. And I think you're doing exactly that. I mean, you're build, you've built such an incredible community of people together that we are able to lift each other up and able to serve as support system for each other and build connections for each other. And there's such a power that you feel when you step into that and you realize that we're either the, the, you have this community of support around you. Uh, and that's, 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 it's wonderful that you're doing that, but it is frustrating that when, when you feel as though, you know, you're, 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 uh, that there's certain opportunities that you're not getting access to rather than letting Rex, you know, sort of stop you, you just become even more determined and you also pay it forward, which is, which is wonderful. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And also, I mean, you, you were talking about your mom and yourself when it comes to funding and the person that came to paint was Tirsa. Tirsa did that. Tirsa did exactly yeah. What your mother did when it came to funding, Tirsa funded her whole university and so many other, you know, courses and training through funding. She was the, that's how, that's also one of the reasons why she became the project wizard and became very pivotal within Cooking Back to Our Roots for applying for funding. And I could really connect the dots with, okay, now I understand 
why you click and why you connect with each other right now because there is this way of talking to funding or putting in a proposal that it's not universal. It's not what I'm hoping. I'm hoping. I'm putting out my my hopes and wishes, and of course, I'm very positive minded that Europe. There will come a day and a time where Europe will dabble dabble in intersectionality more than only doing things above the surface. Yeah, I I also think with uh, with these uh, setbacks in the states around you know the 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 opportunity access around diversity because of these losses we just described that there's a real opportunity for Europe to step up, especially those that have capital that can be deployed across jurisdiction, across region, for Europe to be the one, you know, standing at the forefront. So I would love for that to be more of a message that comes out of this. Like this is an opportunity that, okay, the U.S. is dropping the ball, but the Europe should be here to step in and pick it up. Mm. That's an awesome challenge. We should, yes, we should... Spread that message it word. <laughs> and this is strange. Spread this part more. Let's <laughs> sure well, do that. I do think, though, Vivian, because you have such strong ties with corporates, I mean, these are also global corporates, right? They have global budget. Yeah. And I, I think that this is where you can really remind people that I have uh, oversight of European budgets that there are a lot of companies that have said that they are committed or maybe individuals in, in senior positions that are committed to the diversity conversation. Now they're a bit nervous around risks in the U.S. of creating these 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 programs or funding certain things. But Europe doesn't have that same. You know, Europe, you'll be seen as an innovator. You'll be seen as somebody at the forefront of this discussion. So they should capture that shine and too bad for the U.S. counterpart. Yeah, yeah, love that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is that, and you have mentioned the part for the companies and also for the entrepreneurs, but I'm also curious about what is it that you would like other people or the, the general folk to take away t- with them into now, into present? Well, I think like we talked about before, there's a certain division that you, it, it feels that's happening in different pockets, sprouting up in different pockets of the world. And I think it's just trying to remind ourselves of the wonderful part of finding somebody who is different than you and being able to enjoy a different perspective and being more empathetic to other people and to bring that out in your everyday interactions a bit more. This is the holidays. Everybody's in a good mood. You know, ask for or ask for a coffee, somebody on your team in your office that you haven't ever sat down with and just, you know, try to make a new friend. Let's say in the month of December, try to have two of those coffees or drinks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not the whole year, right? Because I know I understand yeah. he is happy and joyful, but yeah, through, there are more holidays throughout the whole year where you can always have a drink or a cup or something else, right? That's right. Yeah, I and mean, you know, it's uh, every every month has a holiday uh, somewhere around the world. So that's maybe another way to make it even more inclusive and international. But yeah, I I, I think that the the bottom line is uh, I just like to focus on those things that unite us and enrich us and I think as a New York native New Yorker that's maybe I'm born and bred with this the skill to always appreciate that and you know maybe there's times where you really just want to be in your own cocoon of of assimilation and I understand that too but taking yourself outside of that once a month it's only 12 times a year that's pretty easy to do and uh, so that's what I would ask or see what also people take away from this is just um, use this as a time to celebrate with somebody else that you would normally celebrate with and try to focus on those things that make us, you know, complement each other, our u- uniqueness. How can we complement each other? Divide. Exactly. And I've come to the final question, and that is, Thinking about, we both have kids, right? Thinking about the mess, 
leave behind for them. Dealing with exclusion, racism, discrimination, and any other ism, what is it that you want them to have to deal with or to mitigate the current challenges? I hope that they, well, what I want them to know is it's not their problem, it's the other person's problem. And I think, you know, even even now, as I do business, sometimes I'll encounter somebody who has a strange way of interacting, whether it's with me or with somebody else on a team that I'm working with. And my first instinct is always, ooh, that person, there's something going on with them. Next. I, yeah. I never take it as something that I have done or there's some sort of reflection of myself that's um, an issue. That's at, le- at least not my first sort of reflection point. And I think that that's something that I want my kids to realize is that, you know, as long as they're treating other people with kindness, doing their best. I mean, it sounds too new to say, but that is honestly how I try to mm-hmm. raise my kids and if they have somebody who's treating them in a certain way it's not my it's not because my perfect kids are doing something wrong <laughs> it that but, but it's you know something wrong in the way that the other person has, has going on in their life so that's as they grow up i don't want them to ever ever feel like because of something in their personality or their background or you know where they live that that's something that other people can find fault with it's always, they have every opportunity at their footsteps. I know. And if there's anybody who's trying to detract from them, it's not my, it's not my kid's problem. It's the other people's problem, whether it's a sort of, you know, feeling intimidated or close minded and to just take it as such, brush it off and keep it moving. You do yeah. up. I want to say thank you to this conversation because I've, uh, yeah, I've learned so much about you and also your roots. I, I knew that you were, you had Surinamese, but I didn't know the other part. So I'm learning them a lot. Thank you also for this conversation and looking forward to where, so where it's next. Yes. Yeah. What wonderful on a Friday afternoon, really nice to go into the weekend with the inspiring conversation with each other. So thank you for this invitation. Hi, my name is Orlando and you're listening to Cooking Back to Our Roots with my mom, Vivian Aqua, the DEI consultant at Amplify DEI. My mom will be talking to different guest speakers from the African diaspora in the Netherlands. The podcast is not just about food, but also about connecting the conversation with our roots and cultivating a deeper appreciation for our shared heritage.